Yes, if you would, turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4, we've been working our way again through these first four chapters of Matthew, and we're calling our study of these chapters beginning. We're calling it beginning because Matthew's entire book is meant to record in large volume the beginning or the genesis of of a new era, the genesis of a new covenant. In fact, the first line, the first words of Matthew's gospel read, it is the record of the genealogy or the genesios, the, the genealogy, Greek genesis, the beginning of Jesus Christ. This is not just his genealogy. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry upon earth. So we've been looking at this beginning. We've looked at the nativity. We've seen the baptism. We've worked through the temptation of Christ. And now in this section, we started looking at last week, we've come to the official beginning and launching of Jesus' earthly ministry. And in just a couple of weeks, we're going to begin by looking at his calling of his disciples and the beginning of his ministry with his and alongside of his disciples. So this morning we're going to continue looking at Matthew 4, 12 through 17, which we introduced last week. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. It says, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth and your scriptures, for the insight that you give us through them. God, to help us to think and to help us to consider how we live, how we operate, and who we are. And we pray this morning that through your mercy and by your grace and by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us what you want us to hear, that you would lead us and break us to respond in a way that would bring you glory. And it's in Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. We began looking at this text last week, and I just want us to review it uh, briefly as we go back to verse number 12. We see that when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. Jesus gets word that John the Baptist, his forerunner, the one who announced his coming, the one who baptized him in the Jordan, the one who identified him as the Lamb of God who would come to take away the sin of the world, John the Baptist had been arrested by King Herod. He had been arrested by Herod because he had confronted Herod in his sin of stealing his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. Herod did not take kindly to that, so he placed John in prison. When Jesus heard that John had been imprisoned, he knew that the baton had officially been passed from John the Baptist's hand into his hand. John the Baptist, the forerunner's ministry, was over, and now his public ministry was officially beginning. So what does he do upon this news? He goes into Galilee. In verse 13, it says, Leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. He leaves and goes to Galilee when he hears of John's arrest, and he goes to the land of Capernaum, the region of Zebulun, the region of Naphtali. Now, why would he go to this region? Why would he go to this area? Read on in verses 14 through 16. This was to fulfill a scripture that was given to us by Isaiah the prophet. And we looked at this verse, this scripture more in depth last week from Isaiah. But Matthew quotes it this way. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death upon them a light has dawned. 
Jesus withdrew into Galilee to Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet had prophesied. And in Isaiah's prophecy, we get insight into this region. And Isaiah tells us that this area had been considered and been looked at and had been treated with contempt by God himself. Why was this area treated with contempt? Because it was characterized by the presence of many Gentiles, non-Jews, people like you, people like me. This area was characterized by Gentiles, therefore it was characterized by pagans. It was characterized by uncleanliness, and God looked upon it with contempt. But Isaiah tells us that one day that contempt would be removed and they would be made glorious. And that day has come in Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus moves into Galilee, into Capernaum, into the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, where the Gentiles were prominent. This area has been bound in darkness for centuries, but it was about to be made glorious. The people who have walked in darkness are about to see a great light, and that great light's name is Jesus. John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus spoke to them and he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. As followers of Jesus Christ, as we saw last week, we of all people should be the most optimistic because the light of Christ and the kingdom of God continues to advance throughout our world. In the words of 1 John, the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John was, was writing to his followers in, in his first letter that the darkness was already passing away. The true light is shining and since that day and since that time, God's kingdom has been advancing. The kingdom is advancing and the kingdom will continue to advance. And I want to encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to hear how the kingdom of God is on the move in our day and in our age. I want to encourage you to go listen to that message on our website. Those who have seen, how, how is the kingdom of God advancing to places of darkness? How is the light penetrating the darkness? Well, those who have seen the light Proclaim the light to those who are in darkness. Jesus, the light, went to the darkness and he proclaimed the light. Now, people who have seen the light and have been snatched out of darkness into his marvelous light go back into the darkness to proclaim the light. 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that we may proclaim, so that we may preach the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. This is how it happens. Jesus shows up in Capernaum to some Gentiles who have been in darkness for centuries. The light comes to these Gentiles. They see the light. They're pulled out of darkness and brought into his marvelous light. And they turn around and they go to more people in darkness. And they proclaim the excellencies of the one who pulled them out of darkness into light. And those people go back into the darkness. And they proclaim the excellencies of the one who pulled them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Until we come to the day in the 21st century. And we say, how does the light penetrate the darkness of our country how does the light penetrate the darkness of our world well those who have really been snatched out of darkness proclaim the excellencies of the one who snatched them out of darkness to those who are still in darkness it is through preaching it is through proclaiming the word and the gospel and the light of Jesus Christ that the darkness is penetrated that's exactly what Jesus did if you look in verse 17 from that time Jesus began to what? To preach, to proclaim, and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want us to look this morning at what Jesus did. Jesus preached. And then I want us next week to look at what he preached and why he preached it. But this morning, I want us to see the reality that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, the Son of God, came to this earth, the light of the world, and what did he do when he came to the darkness? He proclaimed, he preached. God's design for penetrating the darkness is for the light of the world, Jesus, and me and you, who are described as lights and lamps, to go and to proclaim and preach. And we don't think about preaching behind a pulpit and a building. When you read the New Testament, 
Preaching is not standing behind a pulpit and preaching to a crowd. In the New Testament, preaching is proclaiming the gospel to the lost. It's proclaiming the gospel on the street corners. It's proclaiming the gospel in the marketplace. It's proclaiming the gospel to people who are in darkness. And men can do that. Women can do that. Young people can do that. Old people can do that. We can all proclaim the gospel. We're all free to proclaim and share the gospel. And that is how the darkness is penetrated. That's God's design. 1 Corinthians 1.21 we looked at last week. It says, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's through preaching the message, proclaiming the message. Again, in Romans 10, verses 8 to 15, we're reminded that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. If we call on the name of the Lord, we will be saved. But how are we going to call on the name of the Lord if we have not believed in him? And how are we to believe if we've not heard? And how are we to hear without someone preaching, proclaiming the message of truth? Light penetrates darkness through preaching. I want us to think about the reality this morning that Jesus, the light of the world, came preaching. He came proclaiming. He came speaking the message. And I want us to, as we think about proclaiming this morning the gospel message the light i want us to flesh out four things as we consider the power of preaching four things as we consider the power of preaching and i want you to take note of the progression that we're about to see okay first of all i want us to see preaching just preaching in itself jesus preached the early church that jesus planted preached in acts 4 31 and we're going to come back to this verse over and over as we look at this progression but i want you to see this in acts 4 and verse 31 it says, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. They began to preach the word of God. They began to proclaim the word of God with boldness. The early church was characterized by speaking the word of God. They were characterized by preaching the word of God. They were characterized by proclaiming the word of God. And if you read the book of Acts, you see the narrative unfold before us of the, of the preaching of this early church and the proclaiming of the gospel that they did. If you look with me in Acts chapter 8, we're going to see just some highlights from Acts chapter 8. I want you to see how proclaiming the gospel, preaching the gospel permeated this church and characterized this early church in Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, one of the deacons of the early church, preaches his message that provokes the Pharisees and they stone him to death. And at the end of chapter 7, Stephen dies. And chapter 8 begins with the introduction of a man named Saul, who we know as Paul, who was there and approving of his death. And a great persecution began against the church that day. And they were scattered throughout all the region. And they didn't scatter to hide. If we just look at this, this one chapter alone, look at what they were scattered to do. In verse 4... We see that they were scattered and they went preaching the word. It says, therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching or proclaiming the word. They just were scattered out to proclaim the word. In verse 5, we find Philip, another one of those early deacons, who went down into Samaria to proclaim Christ. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming, preaching Christ to them. If you look down in verse 25, we find out that Peter and John also preached the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. In verse number 25, it says, When they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of Samaritans. Down in verse 35, we find that Philip preached the gospel to an Ethiopian says, then Philip, and this is verse 35, opened his mouth and beginning from the, this scripture, he preached Jesus. He preached Jesus to him. And then after he had the encounter with the Ethiopian in verse 40, we find him preaching the gospel to all the cities between Azotus and Caesarea. In verse 40, Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel 
to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. And what you see there is a theme of them proclaiming the word, proclaiming Christ, preaching Christ, preaching the word throughout the book of just throughout this one chapter 8 in the book of Acts. But this is the narrative of Acts. The early church was preaching. The early church was proclaiming the gospel everywhere they went. Which leads us to ask the question, what could have possibly stirred them to be so open with their proclamation of the gospel? I mean, we look around at, at, at ourselves, in our day, in our age, in our culture, and we are tight-lipped. We are closed-mouthed. We don't share the gospel. We do not proclaim the gospel. We are, we are clearly not characterized, as the early church was characterized, of proclaiming the gospel and being scattered out to share the gospel everywhere we go. So what is the problem? What could have stirred them to preach so? What are we missing? Well, if we go back to Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 and look at that again, we, we see what we are missing. I want you to notice the progression. So when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with what? Boldness. What could have moved them to preach so? Boldness. What could have moved them to proclaim the gospel so? Boldness. They were emboldened to speak the word of God. And we need boldness to speak the word of God. Now I'm going to run through some verses very, very quick in the book of Acts, but I want you to see these unfold. Acts chapter 9 and verse 27. Barnabas took hold of him, brought him to the apostles, and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. He's talking about Saul, obviously. And that he had talked to him. And how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul didn't just speak out in the name of Jesus. He spoke out boldly in the name of Jesus. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 28. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly. In the name of the Lord. In Acts 13 and verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out, how? Boldly. And said, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you repudiated and judged yourselves unworthy to eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. And in Acts 14 and verse 3, Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. Acts chapter 18, verse 26. He began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. Acts chapter 19, and verse 8. He entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months. Do you see a pattern here in the book of Acts? They're not only proclaiming the word of God. They're not only proclaiming Christ. They're not only preaching the gospel, but they are doing it with boldness. There was a boldness that was present that stirred them and moved them to proclaim the gospel. There was a boldness that was present in their hearts, a boldness that was present in their life that stirred them up to preach and to proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness and brought them into his marvelous light. If we are going to open our mouths, we need boldness. We need to be made bold for the gospel. Which leads us to the third thing in this progression. There's preaching, there's boldness, there's spirit. There's spirit. As they preached, they did so with boldness. But first, they were filled with the spirit. Acts 4.31 again. When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So what happened before they were emboldened to speak the word of God? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now notice this is Acts chapter 4. This is not Acts chapter 2. When Pentecost comes and the place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Acts chapter 4. The place has already been shaken once and they've already been filled with the Holy Spirit once. 
Now in Acts chapter 4, the place is shaken again, and they're filled up again with the Holy Spirit, which emboldened them to go preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not a one-time filling up, people. I think we've missed it as Baptists when we give the impression that when we come to Jesus, we get all of the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get, never going to experience, never going to need, and therefore let's run away from the Holy Spirit from now on. If I ask you this morning, if I ask the, the average Baptist this morning, do you know God the Father? Oh, sure, I know God the Father. Well, do you want to know Him more? Do you want to experience Him more? Absolutely. I said, well, to the common Baptist, do you know Jesus? Sure, I know Jesus. Do you want to know Him more? Do you want to experience more of Jesus? Oh, absolutely. Do you, do you know the Holy Spirit? Yes, I know the Holy Spirit. Well, do you want to know the Holy Spirit more? Do you want to experience more of the Holy Spirit? Well, I got Him when I got saved. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell on these people, shook the place, filled them up, and emboldened them to preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 4, he did it again. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says this, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled or possessed with the Spirit. And that the literal Greek there is not just be filled or possessed with the Spirit, but it, it goes like this. Be continually being filled with the Spirit. Be continually being possessed with the Spirit. This is not a one time and you're done kind of thing. Yes, we have the Holy Spirit. And if we're Christians, the Holy Spirit sets up residence in our heart and He forever dwells within us. But that doesn't mean that there is not more of us for him to feel. We have all of him, but I wonder, does he have all of us? Paul says, be continually being filled, being possessed with the Spirit. Do you want to be possessed? And we think about being possessed, and we automatically think about being possessed with an evil spirit, being demon-possessed. We don't want to be demon-possessed, do we? You know what happened when a man is demon possessed? You read in the, in the Bible about the man from the, the Gadarenes and he's in the tombs and he's possessed by the spirit and they've chained him up and he keeps breaking the chains. He's, he's naked, he's dirty, he's filthy, he's repulsive. They want him to stay out of town. Why? Because it's not the man, it's the demon. Jesus comes and he casts the demon out and immediately the man cleans up, straightens up and he wants to follow Jesus. This man is completely controlled by a demon. Do we want to be demon-possessed? No, not, nobody wants to be demon-possessed, right? Do we want to be possessed by no spirit at all? I mean, we are in charge. Or do we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, possessed by the Holy Spirit, controlled by the Holy Spirit, just as much as that man of the Gadarenes was controlled by an unholy spirit? I think that's what Paul's pointing us to here. He's, he's not pointing us to some kind of quote-unquote charismatic experience at the altar where we get worked up and we walk out and we're no different. He's talking about us being so filled with the Spirit that we are as possessed and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God as the demon-possessed man was in the cemetery of the gatherings. Being controlled. That's what it means to be filled. That's what it means to be possessed. It means to be controlled with this spirit. We need to be filled and controlled with the spirit if we are going to be emboldened to proclaim the gospel, which means we've got to want more of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to want the Holy Spirit to have more of us. I mean, Jesus himself in Luke chapter 4 and verse 14, after the temptations in the wilderness, when he returned to Galilee, it says that he returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. If the Son of God Himself needed to return in the power of the Spirit to Galilee to preach the gospel, to preach repentance, and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, we need the power of the Spirit in our hearts and in our lives as well. So there's preaching, and there's boldness, and there's spirit. There's one more thing in this progression that I want us to see, and it's prayer. As the early church preached, they did so with boldness. But they were first filled with the Holy Spirit. But before they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they prayed. 
Acts 4 and 31 again. When they had prayed. The place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. If we're going to follow Jesus' example and preach, proclaim, then we need to learn from this verse that if we're going to proclaim, we have to be made bold. And if we're going to be made bold, we have to be controlled by the power of the Spirit. And if we're going to be controlled by the Spirit, it begins with prayer. It begins with prayer. In Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, what were they doing when the Holy Spirit fell? They were praying. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the early church was devoting themselves to what? To prayer. Now we come to Acts chapter 4 and what are they doing again? They're praying when they had prayed. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 says this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything... In everything, by prayer. And in case you don't get it, and supplication, which is a form of what? Prayer. With thanksgiving, which is a form of what? Prayer. Let your requests, which are a form of what? Prayer. Be made known to God. I mean, it's like Paul gives us a left hook, right hook, jab, and uppercut that we need to pray in everything. But everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Everything by prayer, not everything by money. But if we're honest, we want to look at the budgets before we look at our knees. Not everything by social prestige, but everything by prayer. We want to say, how does the community view us? What do they think about us? What is their opinion of us? Let's try to build up the community's view of us. We don't want them to think we're a bunch of prudes or anything, but listen, prayer. It's not the community's view. It's not social prestige. It's prayer. And everything by publicity. We get a billboard. We can put out flyers. We can... We can Take an ad out on the radio. We can market this thing like Chick-fil-A markets their Chick-fil-A sandwich, right? And this worked for them. No, that's not what Paul says. Paul says in everything by prayer. Our Baptist favorite, everything by committees, right? We do everything by committees. We want to do something? We don't pray. We form a committee, right? Paul's just flying in the face of every bit of this in Philippians 4. And he's saying, you know what? Be anxious for nothing. Don't turn to the budget. Don't turn to social prestige. Don't turn to publicity. Don't turn to forming a committee. Turn to your knees. And maybe the reason we're not proclaiming the gospel is because we're not bold. And the reason we're not bold is because we don't have enough of the Holy Spirit to embolden us. And maybe the reason we don't have enough of the Holy Spirit to embolden us is because in everything we do everything some other way than by prayer. Everything by prayer. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached the word with boldness. We need to pray. Now, we have a prayer room that you can get into and you can pray any time of the day or any time of night you want to pray in the prayer room. And there's prayer requests in there and there's guidance in there and there's a quiet place in there. And that's great if you want to pray in the prayer room, I want to encourage you to pray in the prayer room. It'd be nice to have somebody in the prayer room 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But that's not the only place God hears prayers. Let's just get that out in the open. It doesn't sanctify your prayers by entering the prayer room. Jesus sanctifies our prayers. But pray in the prayer room. But that's not the only place you can pray. You can pray on Monday night up here at the church. There's a prayer meeting. Meet on Monday night. You can come pray with them. It's not the only place you can pray. There's a prayer meeting that actually meets on Wednesday night. If you didn't know that, 6 o'clock in the chapel. Prayer meeting takes place on Wednesday night. And just a little side plug here, free of charge, just to let you know, this Wednesday night we're going to start talking about, uh, over the next five or six Wednesdays, how to know God's will for our life, how to get guidance from God in decision-making 
as we pray. So if you're interested in that, you're more than welcome to join us at 6 o'clock. But the prayer room and the Monday night prayer meeting and prayer meeting are not the only places we need to pray. That is not enough. When you gather together in your discipleship group, when we gather together in our discipleship group, we need to make prayer more of a priority. When you leave this place and go to your Sunday school class, we need to make prayer more of a priority. When we gather together as a church, we need to make prayer more of a priority. Prayer needs to permeate every single thing we do and not be relegated to a prayer room or a prayer meeting here or there. Those, those things are wonderful. It needs to permeate everything that we do. And we don't need to focus all of our prayers on ingrown toenails and gallbladders. I understand somebody's suffering the loss of a loved one or cancer or their sickness. We want to lift them up to the Lord. But people, listen, we're all going to die. Now, did you know that? And we can fast and pray for the next 40 days. And we are all going to die. At some point, somebody's going to be put on the prayer list. And they're not going to be healed. They're going to die. And someday me and you will be put on the prayer list. And we will die. And we will all live for all of eternity. We will all live for all of eternity in a place called heaven or a place called hell. And while ingrown toenails are important to the person who's hopping around on them and gallbladder pains are serious and cancer is a killer, the reality is, is that eternity causes everything we suffer in this life and experience in this life to pale in comparison of importance. So we need to steer our prayers towards eternal matters and begin praying for a baptism of the Holy Spirit that will produce a boldness, that will produce a preaching of the gospel that will shine the blinding light of Jesus Christ on those who are in deep darkness. Here's a question for you to answer this morning. If the light of Christ has shone upon the darkness of of your heart. How will you be a part of carrying that light into the darkness? How will you proclaim? Out on the welcome desk, there's these cute little cards that just have the church name, service times, address, website, and a place on the back for you to put your name and phone number. That is, I mean, if you are not bold at all, you can... Fill that out and leave it with your tip. I mean, just don't leave a 50-cent tip on a $20 bill and do that. I mean, leave a good tip and just leave that. Be like, I want to invite you to church. Or hand it to somebody. I just want to invite you to church. That is the easiest thing that anybody... I mean, if you can't do anything else, you can invite somebody to church. Those cards are free. No, they weren't really free. We had to pay for these cards. So... If you pick them up, we want you to give them out. And if you will pick them up and give them out, they'll be free to you. If you pick them up and we find out you're not giving them out, we're going to bill you for these cards, okay? So that's something. You just go to the welcome desk and pick up some of these cards. How about this? Pray. Start praying for God to bring one person into your life to share the gospel with and to disciple. Just start praying right now. God, lead me to one person or lead one person to me that I can share the gospel with and disciple. How about you start inviting somebody to church on Easter? People come to church on Easter when they won't ever come on another, another Sunday. And we're not going to preach on tithing this Easter. We're going to preach on the resurrection of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So invite them to church on Easter. There's mission opportunities that we are making available to you. April the 26th and the 27th, we're going to be taking a vision trip to Clarkston, Georgia. There's something they have there called Clarkston Culture Fest. 120 different ethnic groups live in this small town of Clarkston. 
13,000 people, 70 plus percent of them are resettled refugees from around the world. We're going to have an opportunity to go on the 26th and 27th and just see Clarkston and experience the culture and have a vision trip to see if you want to get involved in what we're trying to do in Clarkston. And one of those things we're trying to do in Clarkston is June 22nd through the 28th, we're going to go lead a week-long kids camp. June 22nd through the 28th. There's a sign-up list out here on the welcome desk for the kids' camp. There's a sign-up list out here for the vision trip. Sign up. Go see what God may stir you up to do. I have a team that's planning to leave for Germany in late July, early August. Working in a refugee camp in Germany. Sports camp, sharing the gospel, conversing with these refugees who have just come out of horrific situations. Please don't let Fox News convince you that every refugee is a terrorist in disguise. Okay? These people are running from terror. They've lost, many of them, their children, their spouses, their homes, their lands, everything, their jobs, their professions. Many of them are doctors and, and successful, and now they're sitting in a refugee camp where they can't even get a job. And on average, these people spend 17 years years in camps before they ever get resettled if they don't get sent back home these people are hurting we have an opportunity to go and minister the gospel to them and that some of them are the most open they will ever be in these refugee camps we have two or three spots left on that trip Appalachia's coming up as you heard Andy talk about earlier the association takes trips all the time we can jump in on there's opportunities for you to proclaim the gospel, not only here, but all the way to the ends of the earth. How are you going to let the light of Christ that has shone upon you and the darkness of your heart go through you to shine into the darkness? Join a discipleship group. Start a discipleship group. Multiply your discipleship group. There's a slip in the ministry guide that you can fill out and just check that you're interested, and we'll help you find a discipleship group or to help you start a discipleship group. If the light of Christ has shone upon the darkness of your heart, how will you be a part of carrying that light into the darkness? That's a question I want to ask you because Jesus told us in Matthew 5 and verse 16 that we were to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Jesus is the light who came to the darkness of Capernaum, who came to the darkness of Galilee and the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, and we are the light of our world. And we need to shine we need a baptism of the Holy Spirit that will bring a boldness, that will produce a preaching of the gospel, that will shine the blinding light of Christ on those who are in deep darkness. Please meet me to my last question. Has the light of Christ really shone in the darkness of your heart? Have you really understood the reality that God is absolutely, perfectly holy and you are not? That God's standards for entrance into heaven are perfection, perfect righteousness and holiness. And we are not perfect and we are not perfectly righteous and we are not perfectly holy. We are sinners. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Even our good deeds are seen as filthy rags in the eyes of God. But God, in his love for us, came to this earth in the person of Christ Jesus, born in a manger in Bethlehem, to live the life that God requires of us and to die the death that our sin deserves and to be resurrected on the third day so that everyone who would repent of their sin and put their faith and their trust in him can be made new. Has the light of Christ really shone upon the darkness of your heart? If you're not sure, there's a slip in your ministry guide that you can fill out right now. And you can just check on there that you're interested in baptism. And that'll let us know you want to talk to somebody about where you stand with Jesus. You just slip, fill that out, place it in the offering plate when it comes by in a moment. We'll set up a time to talk with you. Make sure you understand the gospel. Make sure you've received the gospel. Make sure that you have moved from darkness to light. Or you can come and just tell me or Andy or Brett as we sing in just a moment. Jesus' ministry was characterized by preaching. If we're going to preach, 
we're going to proclaim, we need to be emboldened. And if we're going to be emboldened, we need the Spirit to fill us. And if the Spirit's going to fill us, we've got to hit our knees and call out to Christ. And then shine the light. Are you shining the light? Has the light shone in your heart? If not, we want to invite you and encourage you to respond as the Lord would lead you to respond as we pray. Father, we thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your gospel. We thank you for the light that shines into the darkness of our hearts and brings us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. Now this, this morning, God, we pray, if there's one here who has not seen the light, that you would draw them to yourself. And God, for those who have seen the light, I pray that you would stir us to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Call us softly, call us tenderly. Help us to respond to you before it's eternally and everlasting too late. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing?